Okay, welcome back, guys. Uh, Dogbone Podcast, episode 20. Um, again, Ben is back in with us. Wonder Boy is what he likes to go by around here, but um, he is going to hold my feet to the fire when it comes to doing these, and um, I'm glad of that. So uh, it's episode 20. Um, I'm actually going to go back, and we're going to do, an, uh, with this one, we're going to do kind of an early format. i um, going to build it off of... Um, a message that I got on, on Facebook. It was a question that I got on Facebook. Um, but I picked it partially because of that, and I also picked it because we're coming off of um, workshops. We had we fin- we just recently finished up our last workshop. We do, always do our workshops in the spring of the year. Uh, it's for lots of reasons. Some of it's weather-related. Some of it's just timing for um, the team that I have working with me on it. So, um, But we are wrap- we've wrapped up our last one. And this year, one of the things that stood out to me, first off, it was a couple of things stood out to me. One of them was the groups that we had were tremendous, like and not just the dogs, but the people as well. And, and I don't think um, we're rarely disappointed when it comes to either one. I don't know that I've ever been disappointed with either one, um, people or the dogs. This one stood the, this year stood out to me. Um, another reason was weather. It was the first year we did a workshop that didn't have a, accumulation of snow on the on the ground. We had flakes, we had flakes in Buffalo County, I think, yeah. and we had real close to getting some snow in the second workshop, the first foundation workshop of the year. Um, the next steps workshop is the one that we always do first. I know it sounds backwards, but um, it's because of time of the year. We our next steps workshop is one that we actually go shed hunting. Um, during the workshop and so we do that earliest in the year because it's closest to um, when we we really want actual shed hunting conditions so we do that one first Uh, there's a prerequisite on that you got to have taken you have to have been to a foundation workshop in order to go to next steps next steps workshop is not advanced Um, that's why I don't call it the advanced workshop we call it next steps because it's literally wherever you are in your training we just we pick up from there and we we start there Um, they're usually people are further along than they are and we just you just posted a video from the next steps workshop um that ben edited up for us um showing some it, we, we were doing a simple uh, walk up which is something that we do in the foundation workshop as well but we we had dogs off lead and we had dogs making some retrieves off of it uh, other dogs honoring those retrieves so just something that we we posted on that recently on facebook and insta i think instagram and youtube and youtube um but uh so that workshop um, is a chance for us to to go a little bit further usually, although not always the case. Um, it, the reason it, the prerequisite for the first foundation workshops is there is because I don't want to spend um, a lot of time going over foundational things and, and f- ideas and techniques and mechanical issues and also um, mindset or philosophy things that go along with it. I don't want to have to spend that time during that workshop um, doing that. We spend a lot of time doing that in the foundation workshop. So our goal is um, we skip that part or we move beyond that part and start applying it. Um, The other advantage to the Next Steps workshop, I think, for those who go to it are they truly see more of a relaxed training setting. Um, We don't have the, the amount of content to get through. So we're able to get deeper, not as wide, but probably a lot deeper um, in, in different subjects and different setups. Um, and the advantage too, I think, is we literally have a lot of time where we, we verbalize the, the things that we're thinking as far as setups. We're in a completely new area, uh, relatively new area for all of us for training like geographically. So that, that offers a lot of obstacles that we don't have here over on the, where I, I'm on the east side of Wisconsin and northeast um, part of Wisconsin. It's relatively flat. Um, you go over where we are in Buffalo, it's on the western side. It's in the Mississippi River Valley. Um, it's in that driftless region. Um, it's hilly. Um, it's got um, bluffs and, and some real... Um, real aggressive terrain so allows us to do some stuff that we just we can't do over here and those are always challenging for the dogs so we have to strategize um, how we create success in those spots so that uh, kind of gives you a little bit of a wrap on the the workshop stuff but um, one of my takeaways 
from this year's workshops outside of the people being so great, which they were, the dogs being phenomenal, which they were. Um, this recent one, we had a small, relatively small group um, comp in comparison to most of the time. I think we had like nine or ten dogs um, in the last workshop, which is uh, a chunk less. So we had some, we had the opportunity to really get into small groups and have like one on two and one on one and one on three scenarios with one of, with our team, our, our kind of trainers team. So um, that really was really nice to do. And 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 but anyway, we got into a lot of stuff a lot deeper into stuff that way. Um, but one of the things that, and we had a puppy that was, we had two puppies that were. Two puppies in the first one. Five month in this last one we had five month old pups. Yeah. 20 week old pups. And then the one before that we had a 12 really? week and we had a 15 week, yeah. I think. Um, so we, and, and that ranged all the way up. I think the oldest dog this year in any of the workshops uh, was five. Callie's dog was yeah, five. Callie's. So, but then we had a three-year-old dog in this workshop. And so, and it's a total wide spectrum. Um, I don't think anybody doesn't get anything out of it. It's just depending on where you are and your dog, it varies on what you're going to take away from it. But uh, we had these young dogs um, that were literally five months old. And man, were they good. Um, uh, they, had, they had tremendous starts. And they're going to have even bigger head starts coming out of the workshop, in my opinion. Um, but anyway... One of the things that stood out to me this year in particular, uh, and this is where it ties and correlates into this email or message that I got, a uh, question that I got via Facebook Messenger. Um, the, the thing that stood out to me was the two biggest keys in training. We're not going to talk about both of them. Um, we are going to talk about one of them. But the two biggest things that I think you can simplify um, from a skill set standpoint to have a successful retriever in this situation is first off it's heel work um, everything is built off of heel work uh, we spend a huge amount of time talking about it um, right down from the very very basic stuff where we're talking about like fundamentals of it and, and mechanically how we set ourselves up um, to get dogs in heel position and um, get a better understanding of what heel position is and then timing with correction timing with praise um, different things that we can do to, to uh, get these dogs to kind of um, watch and cue off of us. Then it starts to feel us. and So we just expand on that. One of them's heel, huge. Um, and then the other is hold or delivery. Um, I guess it can be summed up by delivery. What I mean by is delivery of the retrieve, um, delivery to hand, call it whatever you want. But I think the key is um, those two things, heel work and delivery. And so the reason that I'm going to talk about the delivery part today, because the, the reason it's so important and it stood out this year in workshops was this year, I do think dogs were a little further ahead than normal. And so when we got into the retrieving part of the weekend, um, we got to do some retrieving. And literally there are some times where we don't even get to the point where people are retrieving with their own dogs because they're just not there yet. Um, they use a lot of our dogs, but then we don't see problems with delivery because our dogs have pretty solid delivery. So they, didn't all, they don't always have it and they don't start out with it. And so it's things that we instill into them. Real, real important. Um, I do think it's uh, another thing that was real important takeaway from it from this, these workshops. And I love workshops because I get to see a lot of other dogs. I get so used to my dogs. I get so used to the dogs that I'm training. And I've done it now long enough that I avoid a lot of the problems early on. And I think that's important. I, 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 I think that's smart. Uh, why train something out later? So I'm, I'm big on avoiding bad habits, forming good ones early on, it makes life a lot easier as a trainer. And I am into being efficient. I don't want to spend any more time or, or effort than necessary. So, but a lot of times when these workshops happen, we get dogs coming in with habits that are not good necessarily, not desirable. Um, they're, the reason is, is because maybe bad habits formed. Um, maybe the, the owners didn't realize it and they've, you know, they've got some, a situation on their hand running off and, and poor delivery and stopping short and playing with the bumper when they send them out. Those are all things that happened um, with some of the dogs over the last couple months that came through on workshops. And so the key 100% in taking the next step is 
developing good delivery. And we don't use force fetch. Um, people talk about force fetch a lot. Uh, you hear a lot of force fetch stuff out there on forums and different uh, conversations in the retriever world. I don't, we don't use it. Um, I don't think it's necessary. Um, not going to get into great detail on force fetch um, in conversation on it, but we don't use it. And the reason I don't is because I'm not a believer in connecting negative or negative pressure to something that I think the dogs inherently have or want to do, and I want them to like it in the end. So that's my philosophy. So, but, and it's not mine, it's uh, adapted from every trainer that I've uh, taken things from that use that style. Um, the, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in you. I've listened to people explain to me force fetch and I cringe at the idea of it. So I just don't want to do that. Um, doesn't seem to work well for me and my dogs. This alternative is the right fit for it for me and my dogs. Um, and we get results that way. So, but we spent a big time, uh, amount of time, um, talking about hold conditioning, um, in, in both the foundation workshops, um, we recorded, you recorded all of it. Yeah. Uh, we got tons of it. We're going to be putting together. We've got, after thinking about it and realizing, God, this is like one of the biggest problems that I'm seeing. Um, ben and I started talking about over the last year and a half, we have recorded and, and we have tons of stuff on hold conditioning that we just, plus we have a free hold conditioning hour long produced video that is available through our website. Um, and on YouTube. And on YouTube. Uh, YouTube's probably the easiest way to get YouTube it. Um, so if you just go to, to our YouTube channel, Dog Bone Hunter, there's a hold conditioning video. It's an hour long. It's free. Um, we were going to have it a part of our shed DVD, and then we realized it, it took a whole hour. And so because I do think it's that important. And we ended up, we took it out of the DVD because we said it's, that, that's so much information about hold that would take away from the, the message of the shed training. So we just took it out and then we said instead of um, selling it let's just give it to people because it is that important if you want a retriever whether it's shed hunting upland gun dog doesn't matter uh, if you're going to retrieve with the dog you have to go through hold conditioning so um, that's available but anyway we've got so much more stuff that isn't edited and we were talking about it and now we've done multiple workshops and we've recorded the hold conditioning section or breakout um, so we're going to we're going to look at piecing some of that stuff together and try to show you because I do it with different dogs and different dogs are at different points. The downside of hold conditioning at a workshop is you can't show monumental progress very quickly where you can show pretty good progress with heel work pretty quickly. You can show pretty good progress with steadiness, um, patience, the ability to deal with distractions. You can show that stuff progress really quickly um, visually over a short period of time. And when I say short, I mean, relatively short three days. Um, it is short. It's a micro, micro, micro time frame in dog training, but it's measurable pretty easily visually. You, it's hard to do that with a breakout session, a hold conditioning, because this is something that takes quite a while. Um, it, it can take some dogs just to get to the first step. We can't even get to the first step because some of these dogs don't settle in enough being elevated up off their feet. We put, I use a freezer, um, but you can use the tailgate of your truck. You can use a table. You can use a lot of different things. They don't, they don't get so adjusted that quickly so that we can take a bunch of steps during the workshop. But we've had so many different dogs. Different dogs are at different places. Um, this particular workshop, we had several dogs that are, I'm going to say they're probably like 65 to 85% through the process. They're just not finished. And I, I made a point of saying, if you're 65 to 85% through training you can expect 65 to 85 percent results and i'm not satisfied with that and i don't think you should be either because the problem with it is the 15 to 35 percent of the time that it doesn't work is always at the worst time um it, it just it, it it's inevitable i've i've had it happen to myself um you know i share this story i've shared this story at a lot of workshops but i went to workshops when i was younger um, when I first was getting into training, I, I, I took in as much training as I possibly could. And I went to a, a handler's workshop actually down at Wild Rose Kennels. And back then, it was a long time ago. We're talking 2000 and, uh, 2003. So it would have been six, 16 years ago, yeah. quite a while ago. Um, 
And there's a guy there, a little guy. Uh, I say little. I mean, he physically is a little bit smaller, but a uh, great guy named Vic Barlow. And he was at the workshop. And he, I had a dog that I didn't know what hold conditioning was. And I made some retrieves um, during these group things. And my dog ran up to a bumper and he blinked on it. When I say blinked on it, he went to pick it up. He didn't pick it up. He stood back up. He turned around and looked at me. And I just... I shrunk. I mean, I wanted to crawl under a rock. I, I, I was so embarrassed. My dog was about six months old at the time. Um, I was I was devastated. And Vic Barlow came to me, came over by me. Uh, very, I mean, great trainer, um, great great guy. And he could see it. I'm sure he could see it in in my body language. And so I called my dog back over, and 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 like I said, I wanted to go crawl under a rock. He took me aside asked me some questions, you know, and he, he asked, he essentially asked me, you know, have you been through hold conditioning? I said, I don't know what hold conditioning even is. So he explained it to me and he talked with me about it. And that was like a little one-on-one with him. And that is something that I'll never forget. Um, that sticks with me forever. Um, and it was multiple things. A, the value of the hold conditioning conversation was great. The second part of it was he took the time to make me feel comfortable. He took the time to set me aside. Um, and in a tough situation there, he made me feel pretty good. Um, I try to keep that in mind all the time in my life now going forward. But So when you see those opportunities, you can help someone that you can tell that they're struggling. I was struggling greatly. So I'm getting a little off track here, but that's my one of my original introductions to what whole conditioning really was. Now, I'm going to go to this question on, on Facebook Messenger because I'm going to read your, her question. Um, it's going to all kind of tie back into this whole condition, and then we're going to talk about it a bit, and um, we're not going to be able to answer every hold conditioning question in this podcast, but we're going to do our best um, to get into some detail on it and then give you the resources to find more information. But So here's the message. It says, hi there. I'm, bringing, I, I'm binging on your podcast right now. So this, this uh, gal actually was listening to our podcast. Um, that's how she was triggered to send me this message. She says, I have a question regarding hold conditioning. My dog crushes finding multiple sheds in the house, still tr- struggles a bit with distractions in the yard. However, I know what I know. I know he knows what I want. He's a stubborn breed mix coming out in that. He gets super excited bringing them back to me because he knows he gets a treat reward, highly food driven. However, he always drops the shed within a f- within a few feet of me. Would you recommend that we focus on hold conditioning right now? I don't want to continue rewarding his habit of dropping and he retrieves, but he also struggles with releasing. His command is out, but he wants to play tug of war. Will hold conditioning help address and the release issue or cause more issues. I should add again, he's a three and a half year old rescue, very sharp dog, but when I got him, he was two, so I wasn't able to start as a puppy and, and with a lot of proper foundation. It's been trying, I've been, it's been trying to redirect and correct learned behavior. Um, so let's back up on that. There's two things that really stand out to me on that one. Um, so first off, she says her dog's doing really well. Finding the sheds in the house struggles a bit outside with distractions. That is not hold conditioning. That's simply place orientation. That's replicating a behavior regardless of the influence or distraction of the setting. So I'm a believer in you slowly add distractions into your training. Um, meaning you make moves, you move, you go to a new spot. Um, that spot itself might throw the dog off, but it also might be in introducing or adding layers of distraction. Um, so that's that's that part of it, which is not the whole conditioning question. But then she starts saying, he gets super excited bringing it back to me because he knows he's going to get a treat reward. He's highly food driven. I don't, I'm not big on treat training. Um, I think there's a place for treats. Uh, and when I say treats, I, I just use kibble. I use, I use their food. Um, so I'm not a big treat trainer. I tend to lean towards positive uh, reinforcement, but that does not necessarily mean treat training. I think treat training is another subject that we might talk about at some point, but I don't use it because I think it's a little bit of bribery. Um, not big on that. I am big on repetition and consistency forming habits. 
So I'll use treat. I'll use a, a little bit of food, especially early on with puppies. Um, food driven puppies. Most puppies are. I like to get them understanding recall using a little bit of food. Sometimes I'll get them to sit using a little bit of food. I wean that stuff off pretty quickly. Um, I don't. I don't use it long term. Again, I think it creates a spoiled, um, somewhat of a little bit of a brat, and so I don't like that. Um, she's got a problem because he drops the shed within a few feet on his way back, and she and he's on his way back when to get his reward. Um, I replied back to her and said, I think your dog's pretty smart. Um, you can't take a treat with something in your mouth. So what's happening is the idea of this treat as the reward is creating a habit or an issue or a behavior that an action that in order to get it, dogs got to spit whatever is in it, its mouth out. Pretty soon they're going to start snowballing the wrong direction. It's a real slippery slope. And so, you know, it goes from a few steps to a few more steps to a few more steps to run out and pick the thing up and then drop it and come back and get my treat. So that's where I would wean out um, the food and I replace it with praise. Pra- Dog doesn't need to spit anything out to get praised. In fact, I think some of that praise is physical, especially with a, uh, re- the retrieve part. I get like to get underneath. I don't pet them on the top of the head. I don't pet them on the top of their nose because what happens when you touch them on the top? They put their head down. What happens in order for them to spit that thing out? They have to put their head down. And so I like to reach out and give them some praise, but I'll come up from underneath them. So I'll get them on their chest. I'll get them under their chin. I'll pet them up and I'll reinforce the idea of them holding something in their mouth. Because physically, if they, or even if they open their mouth, if their head is back, the thing won't fall out. So it's that much less likely to be spit. If the head is down and they open their mouth, gravity takes over, it'll fall out by itself. So that's the first part. I don't want to get make them swap a treat for a, a bumper or a treat, treat for whatever it is they're retrieving, training, antler dummy, whatever it is you're using. So that's my that's one thing. Now the second part, she says, uh, I don't want to continue rewarding this bad habit of dropping any retrieves. Agreed, but but he also struggles with releasing. His command is out, but he wants to play tug of war. Oh my god, you got the worst of both worlds. You got one dog that you got one time the dog wants to spit it out early because he's gonna get his reward. The next time when you finally do get it, get him with you in his mouth. Now you're playing tug of war with him. So the tug of war part. And later on, we, we messaged back and forth, and she responded back. Um, so so let me touch on the tug-of-war thing. Tug-of-war is the worst thing I want to do with a young retriever. Um, the, it's possessive. It's creating uh, a tendency for that dog to really want to bite down hard, um, defeating the idea of soft mouth. Uh, don't want, I want to share it. I don't want to take the dog to think I'm going to take it away. Um, I've gotten into recently, I, I'm watching, I'm, I'm a student, man. I'm watching some, a DVD series, um, of, of uh, these, this couple that trained four dogs out of the same litter. Um, it's called life of a gun dog. Um, and, and so I'm watching this video and the guy in the video, Mike Talamy is his name. Um, I'm getting little things from him. I'm getting little things from, um, uh, Let's see, what's a gal's name? There's a DVD right there. I'm going to grab it. Um, Gad is her last name. There's a DVD case under that DVD, or under that computer. It is with Sarah Gad. Um, they, they, uh, they have different, they have a little bit different styles. They have a little bit different, um, they both do things a little bit different. One of the things that Mike does is, He'll take it out. He'll take the. He'll, he'll get the bumper or the dummy from the dog, and he puts it right back in the mouth of the dog, or he puts a different one in the dog's mouth. Kind of takes one out and swaps it, gives him another one. So, but he doesn't give. He's not going to give him another one if he spits it out. So that's I've used that a little bit recently. I'm not sure if I like it or not yet, but it's one of the things I'm trying. But so we don't want to get in the idea of come in, you grab a hold, I grab a hold, and we'll pull on each other and see who wins. Worst thing you can get going with a young dog. Now, she also messaged back after I had replied to her. I wrote kind of a long reply back to her. And then she repeat, she messaged me back. She said, I appreciate the advice. Um, one of the things she said was, I've played, tug, I've played tug with him off and on since I had him. I made sure it was I always won, but now I see that game should have never been played. Yeah, so she recognizes um, that she's created a bit of an issue there. So if you don't have that issue started, don't start it. If you do have that issue, stop it. Um, it can create some major issues for you. So 
she's got issues on both ends of it. Um, so will hold conditioning help her? Yes, I think so, as long as she has good retrieve. This is the one thing that we had a dog in our workshop this weekend. Um, guy's name was Mike Knapp. Um, he had a really nice little dog named Remy was his dog, right? Uh, 15 months old, nice little retriever uh, that didn't retrieve, uh, struggled to retrieve. So one of the things that he was talking about was hold conditioning. And should he be doing hold conditioning? He had started hold conditioning. He wasn't getting through it. And I told him, I said, I don't think you're ready for hold conditioning, quite honestly, um, because you don't have retrieve to build off of. Hold conditioning wraps up the retrieve. It concludes the retrieve. It's the finish to the retrieve. If you don't have the start of it and you decide you want to jump to the end of it, you're building the end that won't be connected to anything prior to it. So I told him, and we worked with him a little bit on just trying to get the dog to make a retrieve. Um, so we did a few different things. We built a little channel. We took some snow fence. Um, we built a channel that the dog would run out and not and only be able to run back. It was basically a big hallway um, outside. We use the hallway when they're little puppies. Uh, close all the doors, make little puppy retrieves in there. This was an outside hallway is what we built. That didn't, wasn't the fix because he still liked to run out and play with it. Um, and he couldn't run off with it. That was good, but he just didn't like to pick it up and bring it back. So one of the things that we did with him was, again, I told him, hold conditioning will fix this ultimately. It'll be the, the end. It's the period at the end of the sentence, and it makes it complete to your retrieve. But without retrieve to start out with, hold won't help you. Uh, you'll have the end. You'll have the final scene without the rest of the movie. So it's not effective. What we did was, at the end, because we're kind of looking for ideas, what, what, what can we do to get this dog to make retrieves? So we went into the water with him. Um, I put my waders on. I went into the water. I don't want to throw something into the water and have him swim out there, and then I'm on shore trying to wrestle him back. You're trying to catch him if, he, if he's wherever he's swimming. So I, I said, I'll go in the water with him. So I put my waders on, went right into the water with him. Um, dogs are very unlikely to swim out to a bumper and play with it in the water. That's the problem we were having on land. That was what we tried to do in the water, and it worked. He swam out to it. They have a tendency to pick something up in the water. They are very unlikely to spit it out and leave it in the middle of the water. They may spit it out when they get, um, when they get back to you, um, but that's why you get into the water. So I get into the water before he even touches the ground. I'm there, and that dog made deliveries. It came right to me. Um, if he wanted to swim to the left or right of me, I took a step over that way. I just can't cut them off. So um, they're not that fast on the water. They're fast on land. I can't get in front of them. So we used the water um, to start the process with him. And I told him, I think he needs to continue that. And then from there, we'll get retrieve. And, I, and then I want to try to move it back to maybe that channel, um, that little makeshift hallway. Um, maybe you go to, maybe you don't go on the grass. Maybe you go on to some concrete. I use a, uh, my front porch. Um, I use that as a transitional incremental step with dogs for retrieving. Go from the hallway to the front porch. They can't run off the front porch, but it is bigger than the hallway and it adds some distractions. And so it's just an incremental process. So the key, bringing this full circle, hold conditioning is the end of the retrieve. It's the finish of the retrieve. And without it, you never complete and without it, you never get to take the next steps. Because what will happen is, is you'll get into, we, we like getting into a little bit more formal work. Everyone does. It's fun. Um, it's, it's challenging. It's really rewarding. But without a really solid delivery, every time you get into a little bit more of a challenge or complicated setup, you're going to go back. As soon as the dog goes out for the retrieve, you're going to just have that sinking feeling knowing He's not bringing it back clean to me. The last thing I want to be worried about if I'm setting up and developing and working on certain skills, whether it be handling, blind retrieves, long lines, whatever it is that we're doing, the last thing I want is to be ending it or worried about the idea of we're not going to get the bumper back clean. It's going to turn into a match at the end of can I catch him? Can he? Run? Will he bring it to me? Will he? tug on it will he spit it early because if that happens then it's like watching the whole movie and not seeing the ending you don't want to do that it's not it doesn't work you need all the parts of this so in order to take the next steps you have to have the delivery when it comes to the retriever i think it's like 
almost comparable to like the keys to the car. You can have the car, but if you can't start it, it's no good. So the keys are what you need to start that car. And the, the retrieve, the delivery is the end, is the keys to the retrieve. Um, backing up you know, to when we first started talking about it, heel work and delivery. Heel work is the key to everything leading up to this point. Delivery is the key to having success with retrieving. Once you have that success, you're unlimited. Like you can do just about anything with them. Um, but you can't be worrying about stuff. You can't, like the analogy with the heel work is, you can't set up any of these drills if your dog doesn't heal well. You can't even do them. You can't set them up. And if your dog doesn't deliver well, you can't finish it. So you have to have these these foundational basics. So um, we're right at a half hour. We nailed it time-wise. Um, again, examples of this is, you know, we're not teaching you how to, to, to do the delivery hold conditioning in 30 minutes in a podcast. I do want you to understand the importance of it and the reasoning behind it. I think sometimes it's easy for me to tell people what's important. It's hard to understand why it's important. And so the value in knowing why is oftentimes enough to push someone to, to do it. Uh, and just because someone says to do it and it's important isn't always the reason why enough of a reason for someone to do it. If they understand why, if they understand what it's connected to, if they understand why it's holding them up, that I think becomes a lot easier for people to understand and then go, I have to do it. I mean, no matter what I have, it just, no matter how much I don't want to do it, I have to do it. And here's the reason why. So my hope is that you get that out of this, um, we're going to, uh, I'll, I'll give you resources video-wise because video is much easier um, to show um, our YouTube channel. That's probably the first and foremost, mm-hmm. Dogbone Hunter. Uh, our Facebook and our Instagram, real valuable. We're doing stuff all the time. That's more uh, real-time. The, the YouTube channel for us is like a library, wouldn't you say? Yeah. I mean, it's just like a catalog with tons of stuff. You can actually search out, go to our page and you can search out some keywords on it but uh delivery or hold conditioning that's going to pop up with some a lot of videos um we've got a lot more of them and so ben now um we've got we've got a pretty hefty list of things for ben to do but one of them is um let's collect let's let's take all these hold conditioning pieces and try to just uh, we're not going to edit them up. Um, I think raw is good sometimes. So we we have used the philosophy of, you know, DVDs and stuff will produce. Um, there's just as much or more value in candid raw footage. Um, so we we we've been doing that now for years, and we like that. We prefer that. Um, I think it's valuable for you to see. So we're going to try it, but we do have to kind of organize it, get it in a spot for you. So we're working on that. Um, but those are. Re- then and then the uh, actual hold conditioning. You want something polished? If you like something polished, watch the hold conditioning video. Um, that one is polished. That one is produced. Um, that's the one on the YouTube. And that's on YouTube. Yeah. So it's free. It's an hour long. So there's a bunch of tools for you. There's a lot of spots for you to go get some more information on it. Um, as always, it makes sense. If you have specific questions that you want talked about, send them to me, Instagram message. Um, or Facebook Messenger, Dogbone Hunter is our Instagram and our Facebook page. Um, shoot them there. I I have started kind of collecting some, um, and then I've also implemented my notes on my phone. So I as I come up with some different ideas, um, looking at doing, I, I'm I've got a couple ideas for articles in mind. So. Um, those articles get my juices kind of flowing, things that we're going to be writing about. And when I do that, that usually leads to some podcast ideas. So um, keep them coming. We also are still um, real appreciative. We've partnered up with some great people, um, done podcasts with other people. I've got one that I'm scheduling for next week um, with, with another podcast. Uh, we work with other podcasts and we do stuff. So if you search, you like our stuff, you can search it out and you can usually find us. You can find us on a few other people, a mm-hmm. um, few other people's platforms. Um, but we also sh- are sharing some of their platforms back onto ours. So it's just a very mutual beneficial thing. Um, we just did it recently with Tony Peterson. Uh, we did not do Lone Ducks yet, did we? We're gonna, no, that one's going to be coming. Bob Owens, we did his podcast. We're going to be sharing that. Um, 
get a couple other ones that we're that we're partnering up with on. So um, keep an eye out for those, but keep the messages coming, keep the questions coming. Um, we thank you so much for your support on this. Um, I got two or three messages this week that I, I made a point of responding back to and, and thanking them. Um, they were all they were all along the lines of I really am enjoying the podcast and I'm listening to one person's listening to it at work, one person's listening to it in the car. Um, wherever you listen to it, I don't care. I think that you know hearing that and getting that feedback, especially for us, is real important because sometimes I am we're a very small company and sometimes I get get torn in a lot of directions and I go where is the most bang for our buck time wise and to be able to hear and understand that people are getting stuff out of these um, that's motivation in itself to continue so um, I thank you for that I thank you for supporting us if you could leave us a uh, review um, that would be awesome and, and be sure to subscribe um, I wasn't even subscribed to the podcast. I found out today. Uh, I didn't realize you had to subscribe to get updated ones. Um, apparently, I was not doing it correctly. So, and we have, um, you can do that really easily. If you're interested, if you're struggling to figure out how to subscribe, you can go to our Facebook page. Ben just did a post with a podcast or one of our old, one of the last podcasts. Number 19. Nin- number 19. Yep. He just did a post on number 19, which was Tony Peterson's, right? Yep. And that was... Uh, Sporting Dog Talk. Yep. And so we, what you can do is click on it. It will take you to a website that will give you the op- – you can listen to it right there. But the nice part about that post, and we did it on purpose, was just to the right there's an option where you can click on subscribe for Apple, Apple Amazon, Android, Google. Amazon, Google. All these different things are just right there to the right. All you got to do is click on it, and it will subscribe it to your – Whatever you have. Yeah, whatever device you have. Whatever device you have. So I'm not real techie, but it's a damn good thing we got Ben on board. So, all right, that's all we got for this week. Thank you for again for all your support, um, and we'll be back.